So hello everyone, it's the Cricket Connoisseur here and welcome to episode 23 of the TCC Talks podcast. Now today's episode, I'm joined by one of the brightest prospects in South African cricket. It is none other than former Titans and soon to be Cape Cobra's opening batsman, Tony Dezorzi. So first things first, Tony, thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today, mate. How's your day been so far? Uh, how's it, Aaron? Thanks uh, for having me. Uh, day's been a right bit busy. We had a Zoom meeting as well with uh, Cobras, obviously with... Uh, Corona stuff happening, we can't all meet up together yet. So just a long Zoom meeting uh, to go get some stuff done. And yeah, it's been a chill day other than that. Oh, fair play. What's the weather like in, in South Africa at the moment? Uh, Cape Town is, has been uh, quite good the last week and a bit. Uh, there was a cold front. and then But after that, it's been unbelievable. And I'm quite close to the beach here at Camps Bay. So serious sun, serious views. <laughs> Lucky. In England, it's been cloudy and rainy for like the past week. Well, surprise, surprise there. But um, yes, starting the podcast, really, Tony, let's go all the way back to the start of your cricketing journey, okay? So what's your first ever memory of cricket, either watching or playing the game? Uh, I think my, one of my earliest memories would probably be primary school. One of my good friends at that time, uh, Chris Sherritt, um, he had an awesome garden pool or whatever. And I just remember, like, kind of after school, it was quite close to school. A lot of guys would go back to his house, you know, play pool cricket, um, uh, with his older brothers as well, obviously used to clean us up. But just, I think it pretty much started there. And then um, I think that's not maybe where I developed the love for the game, but that's where I kind of got the enjoyment, um, the camaraderie, uh, and probably one of my earlier memories from informal cricket, if you will. Did you did you call it pool cricket? What is pool cricket for, for anyone who doesn't know? Uh, yeah, we... Obviously, now it's a bit easier, actually, because there's, like, wababa balls. Um, but we used to, like, kind of skim uh, tennis balls off the pool um, or bat near the pool so that you could... And if you were fielding, you would, like, try to dive and catch it into the pool. Um, so, yeah, obviously, that was really, really cool. Um, I haven't played in a long, long time. But I, I wouldn't mind the game uh, with the weather being as nice as it is. Well, I don't think I've ever heard of pool cricket before, so that's something completely new to me. It just might be. We don't we don't have the weather in England, I suppose. But um, yes, back in those early days, okay, so when you're playing pool cricket, for example, who did you look up to maybe in the pro tier side? Who were your real inspirations back then? I think most South Africans would probably say AB and stuff like that. Um, obviously, I was a big fan of him when I was uh, younger. I think for me, I used to, uh, obviously not a baby, but when I was younger, I used to watch videos on Brian Lara all the time. Uh, nice. He was my one of my favourites. Um, always wanted to try bat like him. Um, and I think maybe even guys like uh, Sangakara, lefties, um, when I just picked it up, I was left-handed. So I just kind of looked at lefties. And I think when I was younger, I used to pretty much idolise Brian Lara uh, or just watch all of his videos. Um, and then I think in the South African context, you'd probably say, yeah, AB was a guy that was exciting to watch as a youngster because he had all the cool shots. but I actually, funny enough, when I think about it, when I was young and I used to watch test cricket, I used to love watching Amla and uh, Colors bat together because yes. that was like, you'd wake up in the morning, they'd be batting, you'd fall asleep in the afternoon, and then like come back and they'd still be batting. So it was like, it was like unbelievable. I really enjoyed watching them as well. Fair play, some great choices, in particular Brian Lara. Um, for those who don't know, I'm a Warwickshire fan. So yeah, great choice. He played for us, famously scored 501 out. In a, yeah. um, in a first-class game against Durham in 1994. So, yeah, great choice there, Tony. But, yeah. Um, yeah, obviously, you grew up in Johannesburg. It's got a beautiful ground there, the Wanderers. It's world-renowned, really, for its surface. What was it yes. like growing up in, in Johannesburg? What's the cricket culture like in the city? Uh, the city's quite busy. So, uh, I think if you end up going to half-decent uh, boys' schools, like I was lucky enough to, to get one, a bursary, two Ks, um, you, you play a lot of sports um, and and funny enough in city schools it was more rugby um, and cricket was obviously a big sport but at, at schoolboy level more emphasis was pretty much put on rugby uh, more crowds would come I mean you'd have I, I played rugby as well so you'd have like th like two three thousand people coming to watch a first team rugby game um, and then for for cricket it was almost like an afterthought um, in in some schools but Nowadays, it's, 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 it looks like it's switching and like there's more encouragement, like you said, at having schoolboy tournaments and finals at stadiums like Wanderers or Supersport Park, you know, to kind of get kids to stick or follow through on their dreams. Because obviously, if you're young and then you're playing like a 2020 final in a stadium, 
it almost gives you that oof, this is what I want to want to do for the rest of my life. Um, so we we had a few uh, opportunities to do that. Um, Wanderers is an unbelievable ground, and I think being in the city, I kind of stayed just out and was like I said at Berkshire at Kears and um, was a boarder, so I stayed at the school, um, and that was also nice because a lot of guys would go home afterwards, and I would kind of just stay there, hit balls. If I was older, I'd get a grade eight to feed into the bowling machine for me. So you, yeah, like you said, you kind of develop this like uh, playing this game almost the whole year, and I really enjoyed that. Yeah, and you, you alluded to there, you played some rugby. So what made you choose cricket over the likes of rugby? Because obviously in Joburg, you've got the Lions. You've also got two massive football teams in the kinds of Chiefs, yeah. the Orlando Pirates. What made you choose cricket over any other sport? Well, uh, grade 10, I played obviously provincials for both. And then in grade 11, um, we have, uh, uh, no, sorry, not grade 11, in matric. So in rugby, you have Craven Week uh, in, at... at um, which is basically the highest provincial team for at that age group you can play for the Lions. So at the time, Craven Week was at the same tour, uh, time as uh, an under-19 tour to Bangladesh for us. Uh, not the World Cup, just a tour. So I kind of had to make a decision because our, uh, our coach for rugby was also the Craven Week select. And he said, listen, there's a very good chance you're going to get selected for Craven Week, either at fly off or 12. It's at the same time, you kind of have to make a decision relatively soon and then yeah once I'd made that decision I pretty much stuck with it um, and decided to go on the under 19 tour to Bangladesh um, and I think for me besides that decision alone um, I just felt that in cricket in South Africa there was an opportunity for me to maybe make a difference um, uh, where I've come from or my mom and I and stuff like that I just felt like there was an opportunity for me to maybe inspire more people than I did I could in rugby because I think I was a bit better at cricket. So I just felt like there was an opportunity there for me. Well, that's very interesting because, well, you could have been a rugby player then. We never would have seen you in a Titan shirt. We never would have seen you. Well, obviously, you're not in a Cobra shirt yet, but that was very yeah. interesting. That's an interesting pathway into cricket. And you mentioned there the 2016 Under-19 World Cup, which was a very, very good tournament. South Africa finished, was it 11th? They beat New Zealand in the 11th place final, didn't they? Yeah. Um, I don't think we had a particularly good tournament either with England. But, um, yeah, what, what do you remember most about that tournament? Because you capped in a very, very strong team. You had Luto Sapomla in there. You had Carver Rayner. Um, Willem Ludick and Dean Foxcroft have now moved to New Zealand are also in there. Yeah. What did you make of that tournament experience? Um, phew, I think when you obviously going through the tournament, it feels, um, you know, it can, it, it can feel a bit tough because, like you said, it's a strong side. I think in our team, bar Liam Smith, um, everyone is pretty much 22 and playing franchise cricket yep. in England, New Zealand or whatever and actually doing really well as well. Um, um, and actually, I think our team in terms of pr uh, producing franchise players that have done well has actually done better than the team that won the World Cup for South Africa. So, yeah, it was a really strong team and I was lucky enough to captain. Um, I think for most of us, it was a very... Humbling experience because obviously at under 19 level, that's a pinnacle. That's a, the highest thing you can achieve at schoolboy level. Um, and then when you go there and you compete with guys that there's no way of sugarcoating it or much better than you actually. Um, they've, they're more experienced as guys that have played first class cricket for one or two years. If you're playing against Indian side, same with the West Indian side. And even, I mean, in that English side, there were some serious players as well who I think maybe one or two have played for England now already. Um, so, I mean, in the Bangladesh side, I think like five or six guys had already played uh, first-class cricket. So, you almost get in there and you're like, wow, um, you maybe thought you were here, but you're actually not. And it's like a humbling experience. And I actually think for most of the guys in that team, or all of, if not all of them, it almost was a wake-up call and said, okay, well, I'm working this hard and I'm here. If I work hard, I can catch up. And I think that's what's happening. It's almost been like, we, we realize we can't compete at that level, but we have to do a lot of work um, and push ourselves. And I think that's what uh, ended up happening to most of the guys. And like you said, we finished 11th. It was a horrible tour for myself individually in terms of runs. And as a team, we didn't perform. But like I said, I think the, the bigger picture or grand scheme of things, it was actually a great experience for, for the guys involved. Oh, of course. And not only that, you've all, as you mentioned, pretty much everyone has kicked on to the next level, all playing franchise cricket or playing in domestic cricket as well. Yeah, it's incredible. It's in, it, honestly, it, it was a brilliant team. 
Um, I was reading your interview with uh, Dan, who I'm quite good uh, mates with now, Dan Orsman from Cricket Fanatics yes. magazine. And uh, he said it was one of South Africa's probably strongest ever under-19 teams. It was a very, very good team, stacked full of quality talent. But yeah. um, yes, not in the same year as that tournament, you moved up, didn't you, from schoolboy cricket into, well, what is it, state cricket in South Africa? Yeah, for, semi-pro. Um, call it semi-pro. Cricket semi-pro. Yeah. For Northerns. What was the biggest difference between schoolboy cricket and playing for Northerns? I think the, the usual ones, of obviously, guys are a little bit more consistent, especially if you're a batter. I think at schoolboy, and I think that's probably why we also might have struggled at under-19 level, is that you almost get used at schoolboy level uh, at picking bowlers. I don't know if that makes sense. So, like, you know, okay, I'm facing Sicilians or whatever, and there's probably two really good bowlers and then two really average guys. Yeah. So you know that you might be able to kind of get away with knocking the ball around against the good oaks and then catching up against the not-so-great guys. And I think once you get to semi-pro level, you realize that instead of having only two good bowlers, there's now four and maybe one weaker one. Do you, do you know what I mean? And then yeah. kind of in that year or for myself, it was important for developing a different way of trying to score runs. Um, obviously, you can't bully guys um, or anything like that. And it's kind of identifying that, um, especially in Red Bull, for me was... I batted six at the time, so, and I had a really good season. But I think I was lucky because I had Jonathan Vandia, who was a lefty, kind of just guided me and said, okay, listen, you've got a lot of shots or whatever, but in Red Bull, now you need to pick your shots, pick your wickets, pick your bowlers a little bit more and fine-tune your plan. And I think yeah. that's why I did all right in my first season. And obviously, white ball is a little bit more freedom. But same thing, it's, it's, it's almost making sure at schoolboy level, if you miss a half volley, you know you're going to get another one in the over. And I think that... In that, at that level, if you miss your half volley, you're almost under pressure because you might have to wait a little bit longer. And then it's what you do with the balls in between that I think separates the good guys, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Of course it does. Um, yeah, that's a very, very detailed explanation. And yes, it's great for any young cricketers out there as well. It's a good way to explain the transition. And then from semi-pro cricket, you made the biggest one so far. Playing for the Titans, the Titans are a powerhouse of South African domestic cricket, aren't they? They've been brilliant since about 2005, 2006. Yep. What was your first kind of memory that you have with the Titans? What were your first feeling when you entered that dressing room? Uh, for me, I was obviously at Northerns and then um, I was also at Tux uh, playing with Kruger and that was also really, really important for my like development. And Albi was coming back for Momentum Cup or one day come and he came to train at Tux and saw me in bowl to me or whatever and then just pretty much said okay I think obviously after your first season at semi-pro you've done well why don't you come train with us and I wasn't really expecting much of it and then I uh, played my debut with uh, Rivaldo Munsami against uh, the Dolphins at Supersport Park and uh, at the time like you said we had a power outside so we were kind of able to which is sometimes tough in South Africa to bring crowds in but because we had the likes of I think Aldi played that game his brother uh, Morco played that game Visa played that game, and I think even Dale Stain played that game. A lot of uh, people poured in, and it was just like, you almost, you're playing, uh, I think I got like maybe like 30 odd or something, nothing like special, but it was just like, I don't even remember any of my innings. I just kept remembering, like looking around and being like, geez, there's actually people here. Like, <laughs> I mean, in South Africa, at semi-pro level and stuff like that, you don't have a lot of people come to your game. So it's like, you know, that feeling of you hit a boundary, the crowd goes, someone bounces you and you duck and it's like, ooh, you know, that yeah. those, those <laughs> yeah. special thing you're like, wow, this is what, kind of what you, you uh, dream of or train for. So I, like my very first game, I can like remember it quite well. And that was special for me. Well, that's quite a nice memory. And yes, just an incredible team, weren't they? Just heightened. I was talking to um, Dane Fias about this and Shadi von Schultzeich. And uh, yes, they kept on saying that the Titans were very, very difficult to beat back then. But um, what's your particular highlight in a Titan shirt? You had quite a few. I mean, even last season, you got that double century against Cape Cobras in uh, Newlands. What do you say was your personal highlight with your time at uh, Supersport Park? Um, yeah, I think, like you said, there's a few. I think for me, um, my, my very first, first 100 was in the white ball comp uh, a couple of years ago, and, and I was the youngest guy. And then, which was nice, it was like whew, weight off my shoulder. I think special knock for me would probably be the one in Abu Dhabi when we played that, um, I don't know what it was called. That Abu the, the Dhabi, Abu, like, yeah, T20, the, the strange comp, wasn't it? With the, the six yeah, teams it was like Australia, England, <laughs> everyone was there. 
yeah, I think for me it was it was a cool or whatever moment because uh, prior to that I'd had like three nets and it was my nets were horrible. I was like, I don't think I hit the ball at the middle one for three days. And then I was like, I'd already pretty much psyched myself out and said, okay, well I'm not going to play the first game anyway, so like let's just don't worry about it. I'll maybe if I play a second game. And then the first game, Bouch came and said, listen, you're going to play. LB said, listen. Don't overthink it. You're batting well. We're batting well in SA. Just, you know, enjoy yourself. And then, yeah, when I got that 100 in the 20 thingy, it was, like, unbelievable experience. Face some good bowlers. Um, you know, like, I, most of my innings were switch hits, and I, I think I'd never played a switch hit before. And it was just one of those innings is where you do things and kind of everything comes off for you. Like, everything you tried works. Um, and it was on TV. It was, there was, like, a moment when... Um, the stadium, that Abu Dhabi stadium is mostly grass and then one big grandstand. And then they had a few, quite a few SA fans in the corner. And then when I got to like 98, they were just shouting like, Tony, Tony. And then you get it. And it was like a big roar. So that was probably, for me, a, a special moment because I was also battling with Chris Morris and he was pinging it. So it was a <laughs> serious moment for me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Chris Morris is a great player. And um, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that tournament because that was... It was quite a strange one, wasn't it? I think they were meant to have a 2019 edition. It unfortunately didn't come to uh, fruition. But uh, yeah. yes, 106 not out against the boost defenders from Afghanistan. Um, yeah, at the Sheikh Abu Zaid, which, as you said, is quite an, quite an impressive stadium with that big grandstand, yeah, it isn't is. it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A special tournament. I mean, I think, I, I think for me, the highlight was obviously because the Titans are taking me there and I've taken that opportunity, if you call it. But then you have, like, Brian Laura in the commentary box and... Um, Mahela Jai Warden and then like you have a a function afterwards and they come to speak to me and they know my name like oh the Zora well bad it is just like what what is actually happening here like dude I used to watch your videos every day now you know my name this is quite cool but yeah that was probably special for me I'm, I'm kind of glad you mentioned an encounter like that with uh, Lara and Jai Warden I was going to ask you this because obviously after these big knocks and word gets around doesn't it I mean I, I mentioned it earlier one of the brightest prospects in South African cricket have you ever been starstruck by meeting a fellow cricketer? I think, yeah, I think, okay, with the Titans guys, you, uh, like, AVs and stuff like that, because when they walk into the change room, they're pretty much themselves. They don't, it, it kind of lessens the starstruckness, if you want to call it yeah. that. Um, obviously, that when you meet after a game, Brian Laura comes to you from the commentary box and to tell you all about it, you like, I was like, that. Uh, I don't know if do I call you Brian? Do I say sir? What what do I say? Uh, um, so yeah, I think meeting those two guys in particular and and then almost speaking to me like a normal person, I was like, uh, that was a bit uh, obviously I was a bit starstruck there. I won't lie. And then afterwards, like they're like, yeah, we must come have a beer together. You almost feel like what's? I think that was of the moments that was probably my, my biggest like starstruck moment um, because I think South African guys are quite easy to connect to and they don't. They don't try to distance themselves at all too much. I think like AB is a very normal guy. You can speak to him. Um, obviously, he's very humble. So it's, it, it almost, like I said, lessens the starstruck thing. But the guys from overseas, it's always like, oh, what's happening here? Like, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and um, what, okay, if, if you could meet any cricketer then, okay, who would make you starstruck? Brian did it. Uh, Brian Laura did it already. But I think if I had to add another one, who and like, and I'd be like, what's like? You'd be like, hello, how are you? I think probably either Sir Vivian Richards or or more current maybe Virat because I just feel like he's quite intense. So I just <laughs> be like, what do I do? Does he even say hello or does he just like nod? <laughs> Fair play, two very good choices. And uh, yes, as you said, both big characters as well. Viv, full of yeah. swagger and flair, wasn't he? Such an elegant yeah. player when he was in full flow. And uh, yeah, exactly. they're pretty self explanatory, to be honest. But uh, moving on from the Titans, this actually came as quite a surprise to me when you made the move to the Cobras. Um, what, what influenced that decision to make the move from Centurion to, to the Cape? Uh, for me, I obviously, like, I really enjoyed my time at the Titans. I did a lot of good stuff there, and they helped me so much in my career. I think I was really looking forward to, once I'd spoken to Ashwell, uh, obviously, unbelievable player for South Africa, uh, left and uh, gritty, um, yeah. and, and, and has had a lot of young guys like KV or Calvary and Zubi and, and Yanoman kind of make it or break it into approaches under his 
stewardship. So I, was, I really wanted to work with him um, personally uh, as a player, like coach relationship thing. Um, and then also uh, in terms of team environment, I felt like the Cobras was a nice young team um, that I felt I could really, really make an impact on and them on me. And I felt like if I could kind of play a role with this Cobras team in maybe winning trophies or whatever, it'd be, it would be a really special um, journey or, or, or feeling. And, and that's kind of what I was after. And yeah, like I said, I really enjoyed my time at the, at the Titans, but I felt like it was a good move for me personally um, to, to kind of take myself out of my comfort zone in Pretoria and, and, and work with someone else as well. We know what fair play. That's that's obviously a wise decision. Ashwell Prince has been brilliant, as you said. In terms of that youth development, they have got a very very strong squad. You look at the top five. You've got Yanama Malan in there, who's recently got a Proteus cap. You've got Kyle uh, Zubay here. You've got uh, Jason Smith as well. He's quite a yeah. good young player. He's 25, 26, isn't he? The uh, yeah. number five batsman. But um, okay, so I'm guessing you've you've spoken quite a lot to Ashwell so far. How would you describe his coaching style with you personally? We haven't had any, unfortunately with COVID, we haven't had any nets and stuff like that. Um, but I, what I would say that I enjoyed so far from the chats that we've had one-on-one -on -one and in a group setting is the, the, the emphasis on honesty and, you know, always kind of much or kind of letting you know where you stand. Um, I think not sugarcoating it. And I think also what I've seen so far is uh, the kind of, it's, it's, it seems like he's going to coach in the way he played, which was, you know, he, he fought a lot, um, uh, like was a fighter, um, grafted, um, never backed down, and also did a lot of, or scored most of his runs, if you think about it, in pressure situations, which is, yeah. which is kind of what makes you a good or a, a memorable player. And I think that's something he, or those kind of attributes is something he pushes to the group, uh, which I've seen and I, I think I've really enjoyed and I think can only make me get better because ultimately as a batsman you don't really want to score pointless runs or uh, non-match winning runs and I think he was one of the guys for South Africa especially in test cricket that when they were in trouble and he got a hundred or something they almost like saved the game and kept us in and were wanted whatever so I think I'm really excited about you know learning those kind of things from him. Well definitely that's a wonderful attitude to have you said about pointless runs good point Ashwell was absolutely magnificent at just digging in, wasn't he? Entrenching himself, yeah. getting the hard runs whenever the Proteas needed him. And yeah, I think he's going to be a great mentor for you, Tony. But um, in terms of your time with the Cobras, what are you looking to improve on? What weaknesses in your overall game are you looking to resolve in your time at Newlands? Um, I think for me, uh, if I look at the last season and the season before that, uh, in Red Bull, I had a lot of starts. So, you know, my... My average is, is average, and I think it could have been a lot better if I had converted my 30s. I think I have a ridiculous amount of 30s as a young player, um, and if I make half of those hundreds, it looks a lot better, and you know you, you have a bit more confidence. I think for me, that's something that I know personally I have to get better at because the starting is the hardest, and then from 30 to 50, that's where even in white balls. That's where I get out a lot because I feel like either I'm switching off or uh, trying to take the game forward when I don't actually need to or maybe not reading the situation or picking the right bowler. And that's something I think I have to get better at because that little period, I think from 50 to 100 for me has been quite easy, I think, for most batsmen it is anyway. Yeah. But from, I reckon from 20 to 50 or 20 to 40 even, that's where I'm getting out a lot and that's quite disappointing for me and I think I've had a lot of starts. I mean, obviously, as an opener, you're going to get a good ball in some cases. But I think for me, I've had a lot of starts and I've, I've actually got past that tough part. Um, and then obviously, I think for me, working on um, with Ash certain aspects of my playing of spin, I think I've got a lot better um, from when I first maybe started at under 19. I think last season, the double against pretty much George and people a lot of the overs who at the time were pretty much the best spinners besides Kesh um, that was obviously a, a big thing for me but now it's obviously about taking it forward and cementing those uh, things but like I said I think for main thing for me was once I get starts Red Bull and White Bull is finishing it or whatever taking it through um, 
And then I think also as an opener, if, if I'm opening in white ball cricket, um, it's almost doing, I think that's what Yanas and if I look at Grant Rulofsson and guys like Roy, um, is once they get to that 80, it's, it's you know, making a 130 yeah. in no time. I think that's what in, in modern cricket as an opener, that's the skill you have to have. I think 100 off, 100 is a good 100 and whatever, but you want to get that 140 of 110 balls. Uh, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think that skill, so kind of that middle for me and then at the end, those are probably the two areas where I'd say I would be able to like lift myself or whatever you want to call it. Again, that's that's very good. That seems like a very good plan. But how are you actually looking to, you mentioned about that, um, getting the starts. That is very much a psychological battle as a batsman. It doesn't really matter where you are in the order. How in particular are you looking to overcome that challenge? Are you doing any kind of techniques you having particular coaching sessions regarding that? How are you actually going to overcome that problem? For me, I've had a, well, like I said, the, towards the end of last season, it's something that did work for me. I did speak to, uh, it's not, it wasn't necessarily a sports psychologist, but someone I could bounce ideas off and spoke about. And kind of identify that it, for me, it was more of a, a, concert, uh, a lack in or drop in intensity. So I wouldn't necessarily lose focus or think about, um, you know, sh stupid things. It was more of that I felt, okay, the hard part is done. I've got to 20. I can relax now. Yeah. And that's, it's not necessarily for me, it wasn't that I wouldn't be doing my routine or I wouldn't be, you know, everyone has their different in ball routine things. It's not that I wouldn't be doing that. It would more be that uh, my intensity dropped and I felt like, okay, I've done the hard part. Now it's, it should get easier. Um, instead of actually lifting it, if you watch, if I watch guys that I really enjoy, like Virat, he almost feels like he only gets more intense. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, like that's, that's correct. Yeah, definitely. Coffee at drinks break because he looks <laughs> like he's getting more intense. And I think that's probably why, if you look at him, I mean, Steve Smith, the longer he bats, the more weird things come out. And, it's, and like he <laughs> yeah. says, it's his way of intensity. So for me, I felt like I would start high and, and, and then like almost taper off where I feel like it should be going the other way. Yeah. Um, and then... In white ball, I feel like that's for red ball. For white ball, for me, was sometimes uh, thinking about uh, too far ahead. Um, so if I got to 40, I feel like, okay, cool. In my head, I'm like, okay, well, I'll cruise to 80 um, instead of actually getting there. So thinking too far ahead, thinking, okay, I'm on 40 now in the whatever over. And now I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do in the 40th over? Who am I going to target or whatever? You know what I mean? Yeah. So for me, it was thinking in white ball a bit too far ahead would sometimes be my problem. And I knew that sometimes when I went out, it was hardly, especially in white ball, hardly are you really going to get nicked off if you're in. It's more of a, okay, I've decided that I'm going to probably do this and this over. Um, I'll do this against this bowler. Um, and then, okay, this looks bowling. Let me get, oh, you're out now. Soft one, quarter point. You know what I mean? So for me, it was more of in white ball thinking too far ahead. Um, and then in Red Bull, just managing my intensity and almost using it as um, classy actually gave me a nice um, way of looking at it like gears. And, you yeah. know, sometimes at the start of your innings, you can get off to a flyer and without doing much because you're an opener, you can be in sixth gear. Yep. But if you read the game properly or whatever, you actually have to identify that, okay, hold on, I need to be in third gear just for two or three overs. That's all. And then I can go back up again. But just identifying, the, he calls them gears, and it's quite an easy way or analogy of looking at it. It's a very good analogy. And not only that, that is a fantastic piece for any young cricketers out there as well. I'll probably end up putting that on the, on the Instagram page, Tony. That was very, very interesting, the way in which you discussed that. And it is a problem. Of course, it is for not just young, young openers, for any. It's as soon as you get past that tough bit, you think, oh, okay, it's going to get easier from here, but you need to keep up the intensity. And yeah, if you do, that average is going to go through the roof because it's already quite high. Um, so, yeah, I don't feel sorry for any of the bowlers in South African cricket if <laughs> that'll phase off. But, um, yes, away from South Africa now, because obviously you have been fantastic for the Titans in T20 cricket as well. Are you looking to go abroad to play in any franchise leagues? For example, IPL, Big Bash, Bangladesh Premier League. Are there any that have really caught your eye? Uh, look, obviously, when you watch cricket as a youngster, whatever, your dream is to play in the IPL. That's probably one of the highest forms of or standards of cricket um, by international. Um, so those are dreams. I think for South Africans, if you're honest with yourself, it's 
because of the way that these leagues are structured, a lot of the coaches are from either Australia, England, New Zealand, and are probably more inclined to, to go for guys they know, uh, especially if they aren't internationals. So, yeah. you know, like, a, 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 let's, I don't know how to, a guy like, um, I'm trying, like a Philip Salt. Yeah, yeah, from, from Sussex, yeah. Yeah, he, he is probably going to get, I mean, obviously an unbelievable player, but <laughs> I'm saying um, in 2020 formats around the, or leagues around the world, a lot more English coaches, he's been around the circuit a few times, he's, it's more likely for him to get picked up. I think in South Africa, our route or path is a bit different. You kind of have to play international cricket first. Um, as a South African, that's the way it is. Um, so for me... Getting there, I think, would almost have to be off, like after playing international cricket and doing well. Because if you look at a guy like Andile Petquayo, who is pretty much really should be near the top in ICC rankings, especially in 2020 and 50 overs in Waipo, um, as an all-rounder, yeah. he can't get picked up in a lot of the leagues. It, it, then it becomes tough for guys that are just playing franchise level to get overseas gigs. I mean, like a, a guy like Yanuman. Milan, who I have a lot of respect for and admire, um, he, if he's not getting gigs in 2020s after doing some of the stuff he's done um, at the MSL and, and playing for South Africa, and then a guy from Australia, what's that guy's name? Okay, he got picked up, the lighty. Uh, he's got a tap. Um, for who? Who did he get picked up for? Philippe, is it Philippe? Josh Philippe from the Sixers. Yeah, Philippe. Yeah, the yeah, wicket so keeper, yeah. Yeah, the wicket keeper. So he got picked up with RCB. And if you look at his thing, it's not like he had unbelievable big bash. And then you look at Yanaman, who's had like a, a geez, he blew, blew it up the water for two years in a row. And he doesn't get... So that's the kind of thing with South Africa is that we kind of have to go, I think, international route and then those leagues. But yeah, obviously, as a, as a player, you want to play in those leagues. It's unbelievable experiences. I think the guys you play with, I mean, speaking to Shamo when he goes to the CPL... I mean, he's, he's playing with Bravo, or, um, Carlos Brathwaite. They are good friends. So, you know, that, that opportunity probably would be unbelievable to experience or have. And um, if you could choose, let's, let's choose an IPL franchise, okay? If you could choose one of the franchises, who would you play for? Uh, I know it's a, it's a funny one, but I think, or not a funny one, I think, obviously, I don't know if you watched the Netflix series, the, Cricket fees. Oh, it's going to be Mumbai. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> I thought about Mumbai and I was like, sure, this, this team is like, I feel like it's like Real Madrid. You get everything there. You like stay in this. Um, the owners are cheesy. Yeah. But I think just for the team and the stadium, the home ground, I think I would go RCB. Tony, you've just gone up in my, in my books there. I've been an RCB fan since 2008. So... Um... <laughs> I know they haven't won much. <laughs> I just like the kit is awesome. Uh, the guys that they get in the team are always really cool. And the stadium is like, it's literally like the crowd is on top of you. It must be yes. like unbelievable. Must be an unbelievable experience. Yeah, brilliant choice, Tony. Um, yeah, I can't complain about that one. I think you're the first one who said RCB as well. So, um, yeah, finally, after 23 episodes, we've got someone who'd play for us. Right. So, um, obviously, as well, in that, in that piece we also spoke about proteas is that something that is in your immediate future or are you looking to kind of build up towards that going into i don't know a few years time um i think for myself it's 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 obviously you set a goal uh, of playing for them and i think with cricket you can't always give an exact timeline i think you know it it can happen really quick for you like if we look at aiden or um uh, or Yanas or, or Calvary yep. can happen, boom, boom, boom. Or sometimes you look at guys like um, Stephen Cook, whatever, and you have to, you know, just keep banging out runs and hope yep. get picked. So I think putting a, a, a timeline on something like that, I think can only not lead to disappointment, but it's something you can't always control. The only thing you can is your kind of your performances. Yep. Um, you don't know who's in the selection meeting. You don't know who's fighting your case and stuff like that. So... Your end goal for me, obviously, or my end goal is to play for South Africa and in all three formats and, and, and dominate. But that's not always up to you. So you, you, the only thing I can do or can control is the goals of, you know, like being top run scorers in Momentum Cups or four-day competitions because that's things you can con yeah. control. And, and then after that, it's pretty much in their hands and God's hands. So you just 
you just got to enjoy your game and hopefully you get a call up and, and you just keep pushing. That's how I see it. Yeah, good. Um, I, I didn't expect another answer, to be honest. I saw it in your Cricket Fanatics interview. You said something very, very similar. So, um, yes, very mature and, um, and kind of collected mindset, that. Quite like that. But, um, yes, to end the podcast, Tony, we're going to do something different. This is the first time that we're introducing this segment, actually, to see if it works. So, you're right. the proverbial guinea pig in the TCC Talks podcast. Um, I've got 10 quick-fire questions for you, okay? okay. Answer them whichever way, obviously. But um, are you ready to answer the quick fire questions? Let's go. Right, question number one Johannesburg or Cape Town? <sighs> Cape Town. Nice. Newlands or Supersport Park? Runs, okay, I'm going to say Supersport Park. Good choice. Day of Stain or Jimmy Anderson? Oh, I'm going to get exposed by. <laughs> I'll say J Jimmy. I'll take Jimmy against the FDs. Fantastic choice. Um, yeah, Dan, Dan always talks about Dale Stain. Right. <laughs> Kaiser Chiefs or Orlando Pirates? Uh, Kaiser. Oh, fair play. <laughs> Sean Pollock or Jacques Callis? Jacques Callis. Good choice. Virat Kohli or Steve Smith? Virat Kohli. IPL or Big Bash? IPL. Good choice. Um, Zonzi Super League or Ram Slam T20? Zonzi. Oh, wow. Interesting. This, this next one's quite a nice one. <laughs> Switch hit or reverse sweep? Switch it. Wow. Okay. Fair enough. And the final one, had to get this in there as a South African. Winning a ICC World Cup final, but you don't play a single minute, or you play every single minute of the World Cup, but end up losing the final? Uh, don't play and win the World Cup. Good, good choice. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the end of the quick fire questions, Tony. Yeah, very interesting array of, of answers there. Um, in particular, Dale Stain. You played with Stain. No, I was saying, when you asked it, are you saying, like, who's the better bowler? Because then I'm going to say Dale Stain, but I'm saying, who would I rather face? Probably Jimmy. Oh. As a, I think that's what I was saying. I was like, because as a lefty, I think Jimmy prefers right-handers. Dale's going to clean everyone up. But I think if it's better, then I'll choose Dale 100%. Wow. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. I wasn't expecting anything different, to be honest. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Tony, thank you for uh, appearing on the podcast today. That pretty much wraps up our, our segment, really. Um, do you have any okay. social media to plug, for example, socials like Instagram, Twitter, anything? Yeah, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're sharing it on Twitter or anything or Instagram, um, yeah, use my handles. I'd obviously appreciate the, uh, what do you call it, the support or the um, opportunity. Um, I think my Twitter handle is Tony DeZorzi33. And then I think Instagram is just Tony DeZorzi. I don't use Facebook. I feel like that's for old people. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough. I, I agree with that, to be honest. I don't use Facebook anymore. But uh, yes, yeah. I'll leave the links to your socials in the description on the, um, on the YouTube video for this podcast. Okay, awesome. Thanks, man. But so, yeah, all that's left to say, Tony, is thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been a fantastic chat. It's been really interesting to kind of understand the psychology of your batting, obviously learning about your cricket journey as well. But, um, yeah, that pretty much wraps up episode 23. To all those who have tuned in, thank you as always for listening. And as always, guys, enjoy the rest of your day.